Sierra Leone's president, Ernest Bai Koroma, faces fresh elections next year. A few weeks ago, his supporters told the BBC that he needs more time in office. He needs an extension because of Ebola. Some are calling it the Ebola third term, a creative approach among many efforts in Africa to sidestep presidential term limits. We could call this the political instrumentalization of disease, and Ebola and politics will be a theme this evening. But it's also the implication that Ebola, more than other crises or difficulties, represented a force of nature that was unresponsive to human or government intervention. And it's precisely this meeting of Ebola and human agency that I want to talk about tonight, about three people and their actions which helped to shape policy and to shape it for the better, and which made a deep impression on me. Between late July and mid-September 2014, Ebola appeared an existential threat to Liberia. Liberia's defense minister told the UN Security Council on September 9th that Ebola was spreading like wildfire. It was devouring everything in its path, and it was a serious threat to the national existence of Liberia. At the same meeting, I told the council that, li that this was Liberia's gravest threat since the Civil War. It was a modern day plague. This is what Ebola projections looked like in September. Just three days later, on September 12th, the New York Times reported that President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf had asked President Obama for US military engagement, saying that Ebola could send Liberia back into civil chaos. This perception of Ebola as a threat that could bring the country down wasn't found in Sierra Leone or Guinea, neighboring countries also hard hit by the epidemic. But in Liberia, the spread of Ebola threatened peace and security. Nearly 13 years after the end of a hellish war, Liberia remains politically fragile. The war took place in two phases between 1989 and 2003, and this is towards the end. Warlords and fighters used extreme brutality. They also used more child soldiers than in any other modern conflict. Between 150,000 and 250,000 Liberians were killed, up to 10% of the population at that time. One analyst estimates that 96% of Liberians were affected by the war. Liberia's recovery was always going to need time. Among the advances today are the absence of extrajudicial killings and of political prisoners. But war was not the source of all Liberia's problems. The poor have always been a very low priority. The country's economic reliance on extractives and on raw uh, extractive export, export, iron ore, rubber, timber, uh, gold, oil palm, has historically benefited a small dominant elite. The celebrated expression growth without development was coined for Liberia based on research in the early 1960s. Half a century later, the finance minister acknowledged that the fundamentals of Liberia's enclave economy are still unchanged. The impact on health has been severe. Just for a sense of scale, if we were to apply the OECD average of 320 doctors per 100,000 population, which is towards that side of the scale, Liberia would have had close to 13,000 doctors. Before Ebola, Liberia had 1.4 doctors per 100,000 population, or in total, about 50 doctors. It's the world's lowest ratio of doctors, and Liberia is the dot to the far left on this chart. You can't get lower in terms of ratio of doctors than Liberia. Most health facilities lacked awareness of basic infection uh, prevention measures or the necessary gloves, chlorine, or sometimes water. Hospitals and clinics themselves became <coughs> Ebola vectors. Most health workers went unpaid, and some of them treated Ebola patients in their homes for extra money, 
about 180 Liberian health workers died of Ebola. New studies show that Ebola disproportionately hit Liberia's poor. The correlates are the lack of education and the cramped, unsanitary living conditions, especially in Monrovia. But the problem goes beyond poverty. An added complication is that Monrovia is the world's wettest capital. It rains for eight months of the year, for weeks on end. Rain mixes with sewage because people toilet, as they say, in the streets, on beaches, into plastic bags, which then block the drains where there are drains. Monrovia sanitation makes it very hard for people to retain their dignity, but made it very easy for Ebola to spread. The weather was also a challenge for the UN peacekeeping operation, which needed to keep heavy vehicles on Liberia's mainly laterite, untarmacked roads year round. UNMIL has been maintaining significant stretches of road, and this was the network of UNMIL maintained roads in green, red, and blue in 2014 to 15. One benefit of this presence, along with 15 uh, field offices, civilian field offices all over the country, was that UNMIL was able to transport uh, some 6,000 metric tons of Ebola-related supplies throughout the country. But the problem is deeper still than poverty and weather. In addition to the slow progress towards functioning social services, everything depends on Monrovia. Politically, administratively, fiscally, all decisions are taken in the capital. And accountability to citizens is negligible. James Verdier, the head of Liberia's anti-corruption commission, pointed to corruption as a factor in the spread of Ebola saying that funds intended for health facilities had been, as he said, squandered. Governance in Liberia can also be highly personalized. Patronage is the main expectation of public officials. What we might call dysfunction in terms of patronage, nepotism, and lack of accountability is a way of operating that Liberians are deeply accustomed to and in some cases comfortable with. In her autobiography, President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf refers repeatedly to Liberia's debilitating patronage network. She cites Dr. Gus Liebenau on the monopoly of political leadership guaranteeing the perpetuation of the existing distribution of political power, with any efforts to change the rules of the game being crushed. So these issues have been at the center of Liberia remaining politically fragile. They're also central to understanding why Ebola spread as it did and why it became so much more than a health crisis. Most of Liberia's citizens have little confidence in the government and they didn't trust government information. Let's look at two Vice News clips. Do you guys ever worry about uh, Ebola? Do you think that's real? No. The government said nobody should even push me. If Ebola was here, a lot of people would be there. Ebola. No Ebola in Nigeria. So the Liberian government bans bushmeat, totally, right? But you can still buy bushmeat. You can still buy bushmeat because they are telling the Liberian, Liberians not to eat it. And they're telling the marketers not to sell it. But people are still selling it because they believe the government is pulling their legs. All right, so why is the government of Liberia saying there's Ebola if there is an Ebola? Apparently, it's a scam to get some money from the international communities, from the donors. It's mainly so because the government is broke. Everybody knows that. The government was able to say that there was $16 billion investment here. They have nothing to show for it. So a lot of people don't believe that Ebola is here. Official government.
So a lot of people don't believe that Ebola is real. Unmill Radio is Liberia's most trusted news source and reaches about 85% of the country. From March, we broadcast avidly on Ebola, but rumors still flew about what was really effective against Ebola. Warm salt baths, lime, cola nut, and perhaps the most humane, cannabis. <laughs> Late July 2009 was when everyone woke up to the scale of the crisis. MSF got there earlier. On June 21st, they said that the epidemic in West Africa was out of control. But WHO held back from declaring a public health emergency of international concern for seven more weeks. The Ebola Interim Assessment Panel, under the leadership of Dame Barbara Stocking, later noted the need for more independent and courageous action by WHO in such circumstances. In the space of a few days, an Ebola-positive Liberian brought the disease to Nigeria, causing the death of eight Nigerians. Two Americans working with the charity Samaritan's Purse in Liberia tested positive. The chief medical officer at Ebola's main hospital, at Liberia's main hospital, died of Ebola. Health workers were attacked and their vehicle was burned in Lofa County, Liberia's Ebola epicenter. So this was the spread of Ebola from June to August in the entire region. Uh, this being June, you see the three countries. This is August. Lofa County, the epicenter, is here. But as we see in August, two-thirds of the country is covered, and the one-third that isn't is the least populated part of Liberia. In July, families started rescuing their loved ones barehanded from Ebola clinics. Partly they didn't believe in the virus, but also they had observed that most people who went to Ebola treatment units wound up dead. Violent protests began to break out when bodies of Ebola dead were left in the streets uncollected. Health workers spraying bleach were attacked and chased away, accused of spraying Ebola. A man set fire to the Ministry of Health in retaliation for an Ebola death. In August, there were reports of dogs starting to eat the bodies of Ebola dead in the streets. Bodies poorly buried in shallow graves surfaced. Internationals began to abandon Liberia. The US pulled out the Peace Corps, the Carter Center, and others withdrew their staff. Mining companies, rubber and timber growers, the backbone of Liberia's economy, uh, withdrew their expatriates and made plans to leave. I appealed to the largest mining company to stay, which they did. In June, we had 10 airlines flying to Monrovia. On August 7th, we had two, Brussels Airlines and Royal Air Maroc. I remember Brussels Airlines attendants greeting passengers at the airplane door wearing surgical gloves. It was surreal. Many members of the government also left the country. On August, 7th, on August 6th, President Sirleaf declared a state of emergency. She deployed the army to enforce curfews, containment, and quarantines. Ten days later, the army used live bullets against civilians, killing one child. There was palpable dread, panic, and a sense of isolation. The police were scared to be on the streets. The president was not very visible. As she told NPR later, she too was frightened. There was talk of a coup. One minister told me, here it's a very thin line between law and order and chaos. In my office, Unmil, we drew up scenarios, including the scenario of catastrophic state collapse. State disintegration seemed a real possibility. The limited Ebola clinics that had been set up were overwhelmed. MSF did their best, but at the MSF center uh, on the outskirts of Monrovia, People were arriving by taxi, on motorbikes, in every possible conveyance, and some died outside the gate before they could be admitted, or even in their cars. Suspected Ebola-positive cases reported in Liberia reached between three and 400 a week in August and September. Obviously, addressing Ebola 
and maintaining Liberia's stability were going hand in hand. Ebola was eroding security, and without security, Ebola wouldn't be brought under control. More people would leave, fewer doctors would come in. On August 8th, I announced formally that UNMIL would be staying in Liberia. Now to the issue of human agency and the three actions. There were so many brave and selfless acts during this period. Liberia's grave diggers and those who assisted in <coughs> cremations, now shunned and stigmatized by their communities. MSF, who worked tirelessly and at huge risk. At the height of Ebola, Cuba and the African Union brought in doctors. The three actions and decisions I'll describe contributed to understanding Ebola in Liberia, to turning it around, and to helping make it possible for the UN to remain present and operational. And you may not know about them. They also resonate with recent policy recommendations for reforms in UN peace operations. Dr. Peter Clement Lugala is a Ugandan doctor with WHO. During the first outbreak, UNMIL brought Dr. Peter, our own chief medical advisor, Dr. Teferi, and the government's chief medical officer, Dr. Beatrice Dan, to the epicenter, Foya District, in Lofa County. My chief medical advisor described scenes of fear, desperation, and hostility of being pulled aside and told in a whisper about hitherto unreported cases. Dr. Peter stayed on in Foya with just a driver. Spending the night in the hospital guest house and unable to sleep, he thought about the urgent need to isolate the sick, to bury the dead, and to calm community anger. He bought plastic sheeting in a market and had a tailor stitch it into aprons and body bags. He found seven people to train as a burial team. They went to the church where one Ebola victim had fled and died, sprayed the body with chlorine, put the body in a bag, and carried it to the cemetery. At the burial, the religious community was present, and the family, the superintendent, and the paramount chiefs. Someone who has died from Ebola still carries a very high viral load, which lives on in their bodily fluids. So the ritual washing of the dead, and then hands touched to the face or elsewhere, meant that entire families were dying after attending funerals for others who had died of Ebola. So persuading respected community leaders of this fact was an important step in bringing about change. At the cemetery, they also buried the PPEs, the personal protective equipment, lest someone try to sell it or reuse it. Peter understood. Uh, Peter had the experience of Ebola in his own country, Uganda. And he understood that whereas in Uganda, President Museveni could get on the radio and instruct people what needed to be done, and they would respect that down to village level, that didn't work in Liberia. In Liberia, getting the message heard meant working with smaller and more local trust networks. Ebola response was initially derailed, he wrote to me in August, by weak community engagement in awareness and prevention. Local authorities at times reacted slowly, and their dialogue with community leaders was weak. Trust was low all around, with a tendency to see Ebola as a curse or as a myth. Some communities were reluctant to change the way they handled and buried their dead, and families moved freely between Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone to attend Ebola-related funerals. These borders are extremely porous. And yet, this was turned around. The epidemic was turned around in Lofa County. Many communities were reached within a couple of weeks. Peter told me about one of the hardest hit communities. I went alone to Barkadu. When they understood that this was a health problem, local leaders asked for contributions to buy fuel for the ambulance. These were traditional and religious leaders. There were youth groups and women's groups, and people trusted those leaders enough to contribute. In Foya, the district superintendent brought all the traditional chiefs together with the message, don't let our people die. They worked freely without any expectation of being paid. And what they did was visit everyone and spread messages. And here you'll see, and this is from Peter as well, within a very short time, the three main factors that drove the response positively. The advocacy, the removal of suspected cases, the quick safe burial of the dead,
and robust contact tracing and active case search. He wrote to me, if the current momentum were maintained, coupled with no new cases, the situation in Lofa might stabilize in three to four weeks. This was in August. And that is roughly what happened in Lofa, the epicenter, at relatively modest cost. Now, while this success was going on, it was greatly overshadowed by the crisis in Monrovia. But the narrative has often been, we didn't know what to do, or the international community was too slow. Still, this was one prompt and very right set of actions. I don't know if you can see, but this is August peak and, um, and decline. These are confirmed cases. So as you see, many of the suspected cases when tested, many of the suspected cases when tested turned out to be not Ebola. Later, the Lofa elders described with pride how they had chased Ebola out of their county. And the youth coordinator in a different county, Margibi, told me, Ebola exposed many of our weaknesses, but what I really liked about the crisis was the togetherness. You'll now find policy papers drawing the conclusion from the Ebola experience that capacity building or getting stuff done depends as much on relationships among people as on technical and material inputs. And deepening understanding those relationships are among current UN policy recommendations. To my own students, don't put this much text on a slide. <laughs> so the short version is that people are not projects and engaging with people is indispensable. And Peter did this. The second case I want to talk about concerns President Barack Obama. You don't get a photo of him. In late July, he evacuated to the US by air the two American aid workers in Liberia who were Ebola positive. You get a photo of the special plane Phoenix Air. Now the US public's response to the idea of any travelers coming from West Africa was pretty hostile. Even in the comments section of the New York Times, it was close the borders, don't admit anyone coming from there. Aid workers, give them a one-way ticket because they know what they're getting into. Uh, they chose this life. And meanwhile, I was having difficult discussions with my headquarters on obtaining medevac guarantees, medical evacuation guarantees for my staff. One of my challenges was persuading UNMIL staff and the governments who had given us military and police forces, that the UN would keep them safe from Ebola in Liberia. We had that duty of care. And as John has said, UNMIL had thousands of personnel on the ground, which included over 4,700 military personnel and almost 1,500 police deployed, both in the capital and elsewhere in the country. As well, we had uh, many civilians with UNMIL and almost 1,000 with the UN country team. This was the first time a peacekeeping operation had been caught up in an outbreak of deadly viral hemorrhagic fever. And many staff felt that Ebola went beyond the risks that they had signed up for. So we had worked to educate our staff about uh, Ebola. We had rules about travel, temperature <coughs> checks, visual checks, isolation facilities, and more. But we also needed reassurance that medevac would be possible if we needed it. We pushed our headquarters on this for months without hearing a clear yes, but all sorts of informal versions of no. <coughs> medevac was expensive. It was just as effective to be treated locally. Obviously not, since MSF evacuated its own staff. No countries could be found to take in Ebola-positive UN staff and so on. And I accept that it was complicated. The terror Ebola generated worldwide was such that some of my international staff simply left. They were also getting pressure from their families at home, of course, watching, <coughs> watching CNN. Every sore throat, every ache in our bones, anything that felt like malaria, the early symptoms are the same as Ebola, made people tense and anxious. When I visited the main MSF Ebola treatment center on August 20th, as they decontaminated my shoes as I was leaving, I put my hand on a wooden post to steady myself, and a health worker said, please don't touch that post. 
The ground was wet, soaked with chlorine, and Ebola-positive patients were just across a thin strip of orange webbing. I wished, what I'm thinking in this photo, I wished for Doc Martens. I wished for sturdy waterproof boots. My flat little slippers and my bare feet inside them were completely soaked through with something. My trust in science was high, but the science itself had gaps. When the head of CDC visited, my colleagues asked him, could Ebola be transmitted by dogs eating dead bodies? Could Ebola be transmitted through water? And he said, we don't know. In my office, we assumed we'd be able to spot an Ebola victim a mile away, <coughs> vomiting, bleeding, toileting. That gave us some sense of security, but it wasn't true. People with Ebola could in some cases walk around and pass a fever screening check. We managed to keep all our personnel safe for six months, but then four UN personnel contracted the disease and two died. Two were medically evacuated to Europe, and two were treated locally. As our own after-action review says, effective internal medical treatment capabilities were never established, and medical evacuation remained an ad hoc procedure throughout the crisis. The issue of medical evacuation was complex and delicate. As a field operation, we needed it to be given high priority, and we needed empathetic, supportive responses from our headquarters. The current recommendation from the high-level panel, there must be an awakening at headquarters to the needs of the field. In short, support your front line. President Obama's policy in July was proof of medevac being taken seriously at the highest level and against profound opposition and gave us hope as did the policy of allowing travelers from West Africa to continue to enter the U.S. with careful screening. Dr. Hans Rosling is a celebrated Swedish doctor and statistician. You may have seen, seen some of his enthused Gapminder videos. He came to Liberia in October 2014. At that time, there was what I'll call a politico-statistical challenge which is to say the projected numbers of Ebola cases were crazy. As early as July, the Centers for Disease Control, CDC, was projecting 600,000 Ebola cases in the region by December 31st. Subsequently, they projected 1.4 million Ebola cases in the region by the end of January 2015. I asked the US not to make their projections public or to publicize only the current month, I was told that policymakers needed these numbers in order to react. Some WHO colleagues took the various projections with a grain of salt. Others gave them wide media coverage. UNMIR, the new Ebola response mission, decided to plan on the basis of 10,000 new cases a week by early December, 6,000 of them in Liberia and wouldn't hear anything to the contrary, even in mid-October, <coughs> when Liberia's new weekly suspected cases had fallen to below 200. Enter Hans Rosling, determined to establish the facts. Working with Liberian statisticians, he helped clean the data and get a grip on where the epidemic was really headed. On October 8th, after a field visit to Grand Bassa, I was personally convinced that the epidemic might be starting to wane. The isolation facility there, next door to Monrovia, held one person, a nine-month-old baby. At that time, Lofa County had a caseload near zero. In Monrovia, patients were increasingly arriving at Ebola treatment units by ambulance, not by private vehicle, and finding beds when they got there. On October 14th, WHO held a press conference to publicize the projected caseload of five to 10,000 figures a week for December. In fact, by then, this projection had been outdated for six weeks. Hans Rosling and his colleagues established that until the first week of September, that projection of six to 10,000 cases a week by December was correct. But already two days later, 
on September 3rd, the numbers were starting to deviate, to fall below the projected line. By September 29th, they were well off the curve. The number of new cases had leveled off and had started to decline from the 1st of October. The conventional wisdom was and probably still is vast underreporting of cases. But to some degree, we saw overreporting because every suspected case was reported. Of 21 blood samples tested on October 23rd, only six were EVD positive. Of 20 bodies removed for cremation the same day and tested posthumously, zero were EVD positive. A survey showed that the decline in admissions to Ebola treatment units couldn't be explained by families keeping their sick relatives at home or by secret burials. The president told me, Liberians like to talk. If there's anything secret going on, you can be sure people know about it. <laughs> so with the Ebola virus having a three-week incubation period, this meant that whatever made Ebola turn around in Liberia, especially in Monrovia, was already underway by mid-September. Just as the defense minister and I were telling the Security Council that the life of the nation was at stake, and before several major interventions, the change was taking root. We still need to understand exactly why that was. Certainly the increase in treatment units, the isolation of more of those infected, greater acceptance of the virus, adoption of safe burial practices were major factors. Everyone washed their hands in chlorinated water several times a day. The smell of chlorine was everywhere. The combination of the dogged work by Hans and his Liberian colleagues, uh, the indisputable presence of empty beds in treatment units, finally led to a rethinking of the projections. But that still took many more weeks. The world was swept up in a massive panic to which faulty projections added fuel. They weren't faulty mathematically, but they were out of touch with what was really happening. Major organizations held to those projections, using them as the basis for policies and for planning and for fundraising. It took someone of Rosling's stature to bring out the evidence. So what I want to leave you with and to place this firmly in the context of policy decisions and for students among us, for your own individual role in better outcomes is this. We talk about the fog of war and the fog of peace, but every political arena is foggy. Many different interests are at work. Ebola became highly political and it became organizationally competitive. In the three instances I've described, immeasurably important practical and policy steps were taken, courageous steps which helped cut through some of that fog. As for Ebola, we've seen Liberia declared free of active <coughs> transmission three times since last May. Dr. Mosoka Fala, the epidemiologist who led contact tracing in Liberia, said, I don't think Ebola free is a useful term. The stigma faced by survivors has worsened since it became clear that there could be reinfection through sexual intercourse for at least six months and possibly nine one more thing we didn't know at the time. Survivors have problems of vision, hearing, fatigue, miscarriage, bone and joint problems. One writer has said that for survivors, the stigma still overshadows the grace of being alive. The Ebola Interim Assessment <coughs> Panel believes this is a defining moment for the health of the global community. Perhaps its most radical recommendation is the sixth and last, that the current high-level panel on global response to health crises should put global health issues at the center of the global security agenda. In particular, uh, considering incentives and disincentives needed to improve global health security. This will need a follow-up and pressure if it's to happen. We say never let a good crisis go to waste, but far too many policy recommendations are never implemented. The incentive to do this this time may be stronger. Already we have a new global epidemiological test case ahead 
in the form of the mosquito-borne Zika virus, which is implicated in thousands of birth defects in Brazil and has now been confirmed in the United States and in over 20 other countries, and which is already on the verge of being politicized in its country of origin, Brazil, where some people are calling it the Dilma virus. Thank you. Thank you.